Recap again, is that what you're asking me? Running water, the fluvial processes. Wind, the aeolian processes. Moving ice, glaciers. And of course, we end not just this section, but the entire class with waves and currents and the coastal environment. The coastal environment for our purposes is going to start with the global ocean. Seawater, which is what the ocean is, can be described in a variety of ways, but it's generally described based on its salinity. Salinity, like you might guess, means the dissolved solids, especially the salts in the global ocean. If you take a look at this diagram on the right hand side, you can see that water accounts for about 96.5% of the global ocean, but then 3.5% are the dissolved salts. Now we all know that sodium chloride table salt is a salt. Both of these chloride and sodium are both salts. But notice there's other salts, right? Magnesium, sulfate, calcium, potassium, and a variety of others as well that make up the dissolved load of the global ocean. And remember, I told you this before, the global ocean is the world's biggest solution. Average salinity can be expressed in a variety of ways. Remember, this is average. We're taking the entire global ocean, which is, which is a massive body. The ocean covers 75% of the surface of our planet. But average is this. We can express it as 3.5%, as you see on the diagram. The most common way to express it is 35 parts per thousand, which you can see written the way it's written, 35, 0, slash, 0, 0. That means 35 parts per thousand, or PPT. That is the most common way to express the salinity of the global ocean. And 35,000 parts per million, which is what PPM is. Any of these work, but the most common, again, is 35 uh, parts per thousand. But remember, that's average. There are places in the global ocean where the salinity is less than 3.5% and less than 3.5% consistently. An area that has a salinity less than 3.5% is referred to having brackish water. So brackish water indicates that the salinity is less than 35 parts per thousand. An area with brine water, as you might be able to guess, is an area that has a salinity above 3.5% or above 35 parts per thousand. Okay? All right. There are particular places where we can find brackish water in the global ocean. I'm going to count to 10. Let's see if you can figure out any of them. These are general locations, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, okay? Here's one of them. At the mouth of a major river. Can you guess why? At the mouth of a major river, there would be the high likelihood you would find brackish water. I mean at the mouth of the Nile or the mouth of the Amazon or the mouth of uh, the Mississippi, for example, okay? Or the mouth of the Ganges. Why? Okay, I was stalling there for you, giving some rivers. It's because of freshwater intrusion, right? The freshwater comes into the global ocean, and when it does that, it dilutes the global ocean with freshwater flowing as runoff off of the continent. Another one is high latitudes. That means very far north, very far south. Can you guess why very far north, very far south? I'll give you a second. Good. Melting glaciers, exactly, because glacial ice is fresh water. That also provides an infusion of fresh water into the global ocean, which dilutes it. The last one is in the equatorial zone. This is a little tougher. Why in the equatorial zone? I actually had somebody the other day guess this correctly, which is rare. In more than 30 years of doing this, almost nobody ever gets this one right. But somebody guessed it correctly the other day. So it could be you. Okay, I gave you the time. It's because of this. First of all, at the equator, it's hot. Hot air holds more water. Remember that part? You know, the whole thing is all stitching together. We're connecting all of the dots now. This is a great planet, the Earth system, right? So it's hot. Hot air holds more water. In addition to that, you might recall that the equator is dominated by something called the equatorial low pressure zone, which means converging, rising air, clouds forming, precipitation falling. And because it's hot, lots of precipitation. And as a result of that, all of that precipitation dilutes the global ocean in many places right along the equator because of this fresh water infusion that's happening 
from the rain. Well, brine locations work like this. There really is one type of location that's going to have brine water in the global ocean. Now, I want you to remember this part of it. In order to be fair, the area has to be connected to the global ocean. That means that the Great Salt Lake in Utah does not count. Mono Lake in California does not count. The Caspian Sea does not count. They don't touch the global ocean. So there has to be communication between the global ocean and the body of water in order for it to count in this particular situation. So where it's going to be is in semi-enclosed seas in the subtropics. Sorry about that. Blah, 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 blah. Let's work backwards. So with regard to the subtropics, remember the subtropical high? This means that you have descending, diverging air, clear blue skies, and that indicates high evaporation rates and very little precipitation. This is where the major global deserts are at, right? Because of that, these high evaporation rates also probably mean that there's not a lot of fresh water coming into the body of water, which means there's not going to be a lot of precipitation to make up for the evaporation, which also means that there probably will not be, in most cases, a lot of rivers flowing in. Semi-enclosed seas means that they have to be touching the global ocean, but they're not mixing a lot with the global ocean, which allows for those high evaporation rates to concentrate the salt, because when evaporation happens, what's going to go on is, of course, the water goes into the atmosphere, the salt stays behind. And the particular locations that I want you to be aware of are these. The Persian Gulf. Okay, I know the Tigris and Euphrates goes in, into that particular body of water, but that's very far north. Of course, we know it's surrounded by desert. It's very hot incredibly high evaporation rates, and the only place it communicates with the global ocean is through the Straits of Hormuz. The Red Sea, which has no, zero, zippo, no rivers flow into it. And there's only a small area between Eritrea and the Arabian Peninsula where you get this communication between the global ocean. In fact, the Red Sea has a salinity that's about 10%, just 100 parts per thousand. It's crazy. The Mediterranean Sea, although it has rivers coming into it, it's still, on one side of it has this huge desert, the Sahara Desert, which is dry. The Mediterranean is very hot during the summer months, so high evaporation rates. Furthermore, the European part of the Mediterranean Sea has a Mediterranean climate, which is warm, dry summer, cool, moist winter climate, like what we have in Southern California. And we know that that's a fairly arid climate. And the only place it communicates is in between Spain and um, Morocco, where the... Um, Straits of Gibraltar at. And then the Gulf of California, also known as the Sea of Cortez. And although the Colorado River flows into it, there the Colorado River actually doesn't reach the Sea of Cortez every year because of so much water being drained off for agriculture in the United States and in Mexico. And there's only that one small area of communication a thousand miles south of where the Colorado River enters into the Sea of Cortez all the way down at Cabo San Lucas. And because of that, the high evaporation rates, it also has brine water in it.